So I have four overriding goals with you today. I'd first of all like to summarize the pathogenetic basis for the underlying condition, and then I'll talk about efforts that are used to treat the underlying myopathy. And then I'll talk about the mechanisms and the clinical manifestations of the bone fragility itself. I'll talk then about the lessons that we've learned from natural history studies and also from drug trials that inform how we recommend that we go about managing the osteoporosis in this setting. And then I'll finish up with some of my ideas about where I think we should be headed as we go forward. So Duchenne is an excellent recessive disease. It's considered a rare disorder. Most boys are diagnosed between four and six years of age, although there are earlier and later diagnoses depending on the severity of the phenotype and whether there's a family history. Duchenne is caused by loss of function, usually deletion mutations in the large dystrophin gene. In the absence of any medical intervention, we would anticipate progressive muscle strength deterioration with loss of ambulation by 10 years and a mean age of death in early adulthood. Now, this is one of the telltale signs of Duchenne early on. This is the Gower sign where when the boy is going from the seated to the standing position, he uses his hands to walk himself up his thighs. And this is um, a technique that is used actually in clinical trials to see how the boys are doing called the time to stand. Duchenne, as I said, is caused by mutations in the dystrophin gene, which codes for a protein of the same name. The dystrophin protein localizes to the muscle cell membrane, and it is a critical muscle protein because it acts like a molecular shock absorber. So indeed, in the absence of functional dystrophin, then there's this lock of molecular shock absorption, and the sarcolemma becomes damaged, and this sets off a whole cascade of events. So early on, when dystrophin is defective and the sarcolemma becomes damaged, there are attempts at repair through satellite cell activation, but ultimately those reparative efforts are thwarted by the inflammatory response to the fragile sarcolemma, which ultimately damages muscle fibers further. Therapies for Duchenne are both approved and emerging. We think of them as being mutation specific and mutation nonspecific. Steroids are, of course, a mutation nonspecific therapy with deflazacort approved for the treatment of this disease in 2017. And then there are a number of emerging therapies that target inflammation and fibrosis, et cetera, gene replacement and cell and stem cell transfer. The mutation specific therapies mean that if a boy has a specific mutation, then he is eligible for a trial of these therapies, some of which are approved, the FDA approved therapies for exon 51 and 53 skipping. And then there are emerging therapies, including RNA splicing, translation and gene repair. Now this is the long list of therapeutics that are presently in different stages of development and they are categorized in to gene repair replacement, upregulatory, uh, compensatory protein modulation, and blocking downstream effects. So to understand how bone strength development goes awry in Duchenne, we first need to understand how bone strength development takes place in the healthy setting. And for that, I like to demonstrate what's called the mechanostat model of bone strength development. So in this model, what drives bone strength development is not calcium and phosphate, but rather mechanical challenges. And they are increases in bone length and muscle forces on bone. Those mechanical challenges are sensed as bone tissue strain at a genetically determined set point by the osteocytes. The osteocytes then send effector signals to the cells working in the trenches. They stimulate uh, osteoclasts via rank ligand, for example, which serves to resorb bone at the site of the tissue strain, and then the osteoblasts move in and lay down new bone, again, at the site of tissue strain to increase bone mass and thereby maintain bone strength in the face of these increasing mechanical challenges doing, during growth in order to adapt accordingly. Now, Duchenne has been called a perfect storm for bone fragility, and I think that's a very apt reference because there are so many aspects of the mechanostat model that are affected by Duchenne. So first of all, and most obviously, there's the muscle weakness. So we lose this very important stimulus for the mechanostat cascade. In addition, glucocorticoids cause apoptosis of the osteocytes, so we lose the ability to sense tissue strain in this setting, 
In addition, osteoclasts are initially revved up by steroids, although ultimately they become quiescent. The osteoblasts undergo apoptosis in the setting of glucocorticoids, so we lose the bone forming response as part of the mechanostat model. And then finally, glucocorticoids interfere with bone growth, and that too is an important stimulus for bone strength development. So lots of ways in which the mechanostat model is deranged. So let's unpackage this a little bit. First of all, let's quantify the degree of muscle weakness in Duchenne. So this is a boy with Duchenne, he's seven years of age, and we're testing his muscle strength on a mechanography force plate. He's asked to take a single two-legged jump. And I'm interested in what's happening between B and C, which is when we measure the muscle power during the liftoff phase of the jump. And if you go down to the far right, you can see that his power in watts is 200 compared to 800 in the healthy setting. So clear evidence of impaired bone strength at a very young age, 25% of the healthy control. So why is this a problem? Well, normally muscle forces on bone cause bone deformation or tissue strain as I referred to it in the last slides. Tissue strain is sensed by the brains of the bones, the osteocytes, which have these beautiful dendritic processes, which sense changes in fluid flow in the canaliculi. So under healthy circumstances with muscle forces on bone, you have bone deformation causing these changes in the fluid flow within the canaliculi, which is sensed by the osteocytes, which are represented by the little circles on this graph. And that fluid flow then regulates the osteocytes production of sclerostin, which is a potent inhibitor of bone formation, and rank ligand, which is a potent stimulus for bone resorption. So the balance of formation and resorption is regulated by the osteocyte, which is sensing the deformation by changes in the fluid flow in the canaliculi brought about by the deformation. So further, how does this work? So at rest, sclerostin is upregulated or in cases of muscle weakness, which inhibits the Wnt signaling system, the bone formation pathway. But in the setting of mechanical stimulation, then SOST is down-regulated, which causes a release of inhibition on the LRP5 Wnt signaling system. And you get periosteal apposition or bone modeling, which fosters bone strength. So in the healthy child with muscle forces, you have the, this progressive periosteal apposition, which increases the bone cross-section, and that makes bone stronger. In children with muscle weakness, you have no change in periosteal apposition, stagnant bone cross-section, and as a result, this drives bone weakness. Now this bears out very nicely in the MDX mouse, the Murray model of Duchenne. You can see that the cross-sectional area is reduced compared to the healthy mouse and the cortical bone area. This rim is also less as is the cortical bone thickness. But in addition to this intimate mechanical communication between muscle and bone, there's also biochemical communication between the two organs. So osteokines regulate muscle strength and muscle regulates bone strength through myokines acting on bone. And just as an example, irisin is a myokine that positively modulates bone strength and rank ligand is an osteokine that negatively regulates muscle strength. So a very intimate and complex interaction indeed. Now this slide provides proof of principle that the osteokine rank ligand, which stimulates bone resorption, is expressed in the muscle of the MDX mouse and also the double knockout mouse. So draw your eyes to the bottom. Second from the bottom, you see rank ligand expressed in the MDX mouse and also in the double knockout. And then you can see the degree of expressivity on the far right. So again, proof of principle that an osteokine which regulates bone strength is also present in muscle. So I mentioned that glucocorticoids wreak havoc on the mechanostat model. So let's talk about that in more detail. So as noted in a Crocker review recently, glucocorticoids have shown consistent benefits 
to Duchenne in clinical trials. We know that they prolong ambulation by two years. We know that they decrease the frequency of scoliosis dramatically. In fact, I myself have not seen a boy with Duchenne on steroids need scoliosis surgery for some time. We know that they improve cardiorespiratory function, which provides the rationale for continuing steroids even beyond loss of ambulation and they extend life expectancy into the mid 20s. Steroids are beneficial to Duchenne by decreasing inflammation through the NF-kappa B or the rank signaling system. However, their harsh side effects limit their use. So just as one example, it's been shown that there's double the risk of fractures if steroids are started before five years of age in Duchenne. And this is notionally imperfect because obviously if you have a myopathy that's operative in utero and early on following birth, you want to be starting your therapy as early as possible. Of course, we love steroids for the immunosuppressive properties and other properties, but they do come at a tremendous cost in terms of side effects. And so we are talking about osteoporosis as just one of many side effects today. So there are three different glucocorticoid prescriptions that are used within and across centers as part of routine standards of care. There are also others, but these are the three most common. Daily prednisone, daily deflazacort, and also intermittent prednisone, with the intermittency prescribed in the spirit of trying to keep some of the side effects in abeyance. Now, these three different regimens are going head to head in a very important trial called the 4DMD study which is looking at the relative benefit and the relative safety, including to bone, of these three different agents. And so the results of this trial are highly anticipated, and we hope to hear about them sometime in the next year or two. This is a slide by Jaron Wong's group looking at the UK North Star Observational Registry, and he shows a very nice clear linear relationship between glucocorticoid duration and fracture probability. So you can see that after two years of steroids in Duchenne, there's a 10% probability of a clinical fact fracture, meaning a symptomatic fracture. And then by eight years of steroid therapy, there's a 50% chance of a clinical fracture. So with that background in mind, let's talk now about the clinical manifestations of osteoporosis in Duchenne. We'll talk about the potential for medication unassisted recovery, if it even exists in Duchenne. We'll talk about how best to diagnose and monitor osteoporosis, and we'll talk about treatment strategies. So the point that I'd like to make here is that we know that the muscle weakness largely drives the long bone and other nonverbal fractures, but that the steroids potentiate the fracture risk. And we know that the steroids largely drive the vertebral fractures, but that the muscle weakness also contributes. And I say that because there are cases of boys not on steroids, never on steroids, who have had vertebral fractures, although less commonly than if they have had steroids. The extremity fracture prevalence is 30 to 60%, depending on the series that you read, with doubling of the risk of a fracture if on steroids. We know the most frequent sites of fractures are the tib-fib, followed by the femur, followed by the humerus, and then the forearm. And even that is interesting to me because, as you know, in healthy children, the most common site of fractures are the forearm. So clearly, we have pathology here, even in the fre frequency of fractures at different sites. And what bothers me about long bone fractures is that they can lead to permanent premature loss of ambulation. So if you are caring for a boy with Duchenne who's on steroids, you anticipate he's going to walk at 12 and he has a femur fracture that takes him off his feet permanently at eight. You can appreciate just how devastating that would be for families. The other thing that bothers me about long bone injuries and long bone fractures is the fat embolism syndrome. So this is a very important report by Laura McAdam out of Toronto. She reported five boys with steroid treated Duchenne who developed acute respiratory distress syndrome after minor falls. They did not have fractures. They had falls and presumably bone bruises or bone injuries. Four out of five boys deteriorated rapidly and died within 36 hours. All of the boys met clinical criteria for FES, as you see on the right, and autopsy confirmed FES in the two uh, out of two boys who underwent autopsy. <laughs> 
So very concerning indeed. And the take home message here is that any boy with a fall or a fracture followed by acute respiratory distress needs to be considered for FES. And this is a life threatening emergency. So the pathophysiology of FES is a little bit complex. I'm gonna just simplify it here for you. But what we know is that anyone on steroids and anyone who has compromised mobility has a potential for adipocytes to build up in the bone marrow. And then with a bone injury or a fracture, those adipocytes get into the circulation and form fat globules, which shower the lungs. And that is uh, one of the prevailing theories about the development of FES. Now this is what the bones look like at the organ level and I just love this slide because there's so much information and in fact I want to share with you that as endocrinologists I think we're really good at looking at growth and puberty and bone density scans and biochemistry. We also really need to be looking at our x-rays because there's so much information. So what can I say about this boy with Duchenne? Well, first of all, the bones are radiolucent, so I know that the bone density is going to be low when I measure it. I see prominent trabecular markings down here in the distal uh, trabecula. Uh, I see that there is a lack of periosteal apposition, so a gracile bone, which is a tremendous driver for bone fragility. And I see that the cortex is thin relative to the healthy a boy here at the mid shaft of the femur. And then of course I see the little crack in the distal femur. This is a very classic type of fracture. The cortex gets thinner as it approaches the growth plate. The balls, boys frequently fall on their knees or on their legs and a distal femur fracture is quite classic because this is a vulnerable part of the skeleton to begin with. Now we can quantify muscle and bone density and geometry by different techniques, including peripheral quantitative computed tomography, which we can do at the tibia or at the radius. This is a very low radiation technique, even lower radiation than a DEXA. Boys do need to sit still for about 20 minutes, so you usually can't start to acquire the scans until they're about six years of age. And this is a very nice technique that gives us a volumetric BMD and an overall picture of the bone geometry. We can look at the tibia and the fibula. We can look at the 3% site adjacent to the growth plate here. And we can look farther up the diaphysis and then we can look at 66% from the growth plate, which is where muscle is maximal. So you can look at muscle bone relationships. And so this just provides you a bit of a 50 foot view of what the bone looks like in Duchenne. So imagine you're looking at the tibia from the top down. And what I'd really like to uh, draw your attention to is at the 3% site we see compared to OI, which is a congenital bone disease as well, and neuroblastoma, which is acquired, that there's very little trabecular bone in red and that the cortex is very thin. And then as you go up the tibia, you really start to appreciate this very small bone in terms of periosteal circumference, even smaller than osteogenesis imperfecta, which is also a congenital bone disorder, and certainly smaller than the neuroblastoma setting where there's an acquired bone defect. Now, Frank Rauch measures PQCT at the radius. I measured at the tibia. He shared this slide with me and he's quantified the total cross-sectional area with a Z-score of minus 3.2 in Duchenne at 15 years of age and the bone mineral content of the radius at the 66% is minus 6.4. So really very dramatic changes in bone mass and bone geometry. Now I like to look at bone under the microscope and you can see on the right that once again we see this gracile bone even at the iliac crest. In this uh, representative example we have a very thin cortex and also a lack of trabecular bone. And then if you look at the bottom you can see we've quantified the average bone formation rate after years of steroids in four boys with Duchenne and it's 50 percent of the healthy average and that's before introducing bisphosphonate therapy. Now, what about vertebral fractures? Vertebral fractures are frequent in Duchenne. This is the index patient that got me thinking about the spine in this context. This was many years ago now. He was 13 and came into our emergency room in the middle of the night after five years of daily deflazacord. He needed morphine for pain control. His entire spine was collapsed. I don't need to point out the features of the transiliac bone biopsy compared to the healthy control. They're so obvious, just a profound osteoporosis. 
And what we know about vertebral fractures is that in addition to pain, they can cause kyphosis. And also I've seen vertebral fractures when advanced in an older boy cause premature permanent loss of ambulation. We know the symptomatic vertebral fracture prevalence on steroids is about 30 to 50%. We also know that vertebral fractures are frequently asymptomatic, particularly in their early phases, but also in more advanced cases from time to time. So we think that the overall prevalence of fractures in this setting is far more than 50%, and we have a study going on now to quantify that. So what else do we know about vertebral fractures in this setting? Well, we know that they occur on as early as six months after starting steroids and on average one and a half to two years after glucocorticoid administration for the first time. This is an example. This is an eight-year-old boy on steroids. We've started to monitor. He has a beautiful spine. A year later, he has a grade one T9 fracture. And then two years later, in the absence of bone protection, his T9 fracture has collapsed further and he has a new fracture at T10. So this is called the vertebral fracture cascade, which in Duchenne is like a train accelerating out of the station. The vertebral fracture cascade is the following. So in patients with risk factors ongoing for fractures of the spine, if they have a vertebral fracture at time point A, they're more likely to have new fractures at time point B, both worsening of existing and incident fractures in previously normal vertebral bodies. So why are vertebral fractures so important? Well, in children, they're associated with back pain, kyphosis, loss of height, and premature loss of ambulation, as I said. In adults, they're also linked to back pain, kyphosis, and loss of height. But they've also been reported to cause excess mortality rates and reduced lung function. This study by Watanabe that I cite down below looked at postmenopausal women with and without vertebral fractures and no antecedent lung disease. And those with vertebral fractures had lower pulmonary function tests than those without. So in the setting of Duchenne muscular dystrophy where cardiorespiratory compromise is so important, I think taking care of the integrity of the vertebral heights is paramount. Now, vertebral fractures are so important that we recommend standardized reporting. We have validated through the Canadian STOP Consortium that the Genant method is appropriate for children because Genant defined fractures are linked to low and declining spine BMDZ scores, to back pain, but most importantly, Genant defined vertebral fractures in children predict future vertebral and long bone fractures regardless of the fracture grade. So even grade one and mild asymptomatic fractures predict future long bone and vertebral fractures. A loss of vertebral height ratio of more than 20% critically defines a vertebral fracture. So here's some examples, anterior wedging, crush, and biconcave. Now, when radiologists look at an x-ray or you as the clinicians and you say, gosh, I'm not sure if it's 19% loss of height or is it 22% because there is a little bit of variability on that precision, you can draw on qualitative signs of vertebral fractures to make a decision and they include loss of end plate parallelism, anterior cortical buckling, which is a sign we only see in older kids because the anterior cortex does not ossify till later in puberty, and also end plate interruption, which is a little snap in the cortex of the vertebral end plate, just like a snap in the cortex of a long bone. Again, vertebral fractures are so important that we'd like to be screening for them readily in high-risk children. This is a VFA or vertebral fracture assessment by DEXA, which is an extremely low radiation method of capturing a vertebral morphology and really gives a very nice image on the newer DEXA machines as opposed to the older DEXA machines. And working with the ISCD, we have uh, published recently recommendations for how and when to use VFA by DEXA for high-risk children in this setting. Now, I've been very interested in the timing and the characteristics of first fractures, both first vertebral and first non-vertebral fractures, because if we're going to try to prevent fractures, we need to know when they first appear. So we did a, a retrospective review of all the boys that had been coming to meet in clinic for many years. And we divided the boys in terms of their first vertebral fractures into those who had annual to biennial spine surveillance so every one to two years, and those who had no routine spine surveillance and presented to medical attention with back pain here in red.
And what we saw was very intuitive that if you do regular spine surveillance, that the boys show up with their first vertebral fractures at a younger age, nine versus 12 years. They show up after less glucocorticoid exposure, about one and a half compared to five years. And they show up with fewer vertebral fractures per patient, about one and a half versus five fractures per patient, depending on how they're monitored. Similarly, if a boy was identified with his first fracture following routine spine surveillance, he comes with a much better BMDZ score, about minus 0.3 compared to minus 2.5 in those who presented with back pain to medical attention years later. Now in that study, which I cite at the bottom here, we also showed in this cohort, it was 30 boys, that the time to first long bone fracture was around the same time as first vertebral fractures in terms of duration since steroid exposure and age. But the other thing that we learned was that long bone fractures herald future vertebral fractures. So this is a representative example from our study. This is a boy who had a fracture of the tibia at six years of age. I don't have the x-ray because I didn't see him. He didn't have any spine surveillance or monitoring. He came back seven years later at 13 years of age on steroids the whole while and his spine was completely collapsed. So this speaks to the importance of identifying and treating early fractures, including first long bone fractures. So we don't need to have multiple fractures in this setting of the long bones before we have to say they have osteoporosis. This patient's first osteoporotic event was at six. What about the BMD phenotype? So this is a large cohort of boys with um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. You can see the whole body BMD Z score declines in a way that's in relationship to the declining muscle function, but the spine BMD Z score holds on for longer. And so if you only look at the spine, you're not gonna check, catch the early decrements in BMD. And so I encourage you to look at multiple skeletal sites. This is again a representative example from my clinic, an 11 year old boy on steroids. You can see that the hip decline is most profound, followed by the whole body, uh, followed by the spine. So I encourage you to look at different skeletal sites, not just the spine, and we consider a half a standard deviation decline or more to be clinically significant. So we've talked about worsening of fractures of the spine. What about the potential to recover through vertebral body reshaping in Duchenne? So vertebral body reshaping is a growth mediated phenomenon. So it does not occur if you're not growing well. The prototypical example of vertebral body reshaping after fractures is leukemia where 80% of children who have sustained vertebral fractures at diagnosis or in the years following leukemia will undergo complete vertebral body reshaping. So why is reshaping so frequent in leukemia? Well, for one, they're diagnosed usually at a young age, so they have many years to grow and to reshape. And you can see from the montage that it does take many years to fully reshape. This boy, it took six years. The oncologists give steroids intermittently, five days on, 25 days off, for example, so that allows the bone to recover. And leukemia is a transient bone health threat for most children, fortunately. So it's very important in the decision pathway to stop and say, what is the likelihood of my patient to recover from a vertebral fracture? And we know that there are risk factors that decrease the likelihood of recovery. And with Duchenne, they fall very squarely here in this first dark blue bullet at the top that they have persistent risk factors. And so it's not surprising then that there are no reports of spontaneous vertebral body reshaping in Duchenne because they don't grow well when they're on steroids. The steroids are long-term, usually. The myopathy is progressive and that vertebral fracture cascade is in motion that I talked about earlier. So people have asked, what if we use intermittent steroids? Can we preserve bone? And the answer is yes, but at a cost to muscle. So Nicola Trabtree at her center in Birmingham looked at boys on daily glucocorticoid, daily prednisone versus intermittent prednisone, and looked at the vertebral fracture prevalence at two years and saw that 40% had fractures on daily and 8% had fractures on intermittent. But when you look at the paper, it was at a cost to muscle strength. 
This paper provides additional proof that daily uh, glucocorticoid therapy is more toxic to bone than intermittent. This is again the UK North Star database, which shows that daily prednisolone and deflazacort had a higher cumulative risk of a fracture compared to intermittent uh, prednisolone and intermittent deflazacort. So we have a very delicate balance here between steroids and benefits to muscle health and bone toxicity. So if we give less steroid exposure, yes, there's bone health threats being minimized, but at a cost to muscle strength. So to try to deal with this, Eric Hoffman's group has been developing a drug called Vomorolone or VBP15, which retains its anti-inflammatory properties, but it has reduced glucocorticoid response elements. So it is a steroid, but a dissociative steroid. And the idea here is to preserve muscle strength, but without the side effects, including toxicity to bone. And when you look at the preclinical studies, you can see that the mice held by their tails treated with vomorolone were uh, nice and long compared to the prednisone treated mouse and that the trabecular thickness here in the middle on VBP15 is better compared to the prednisone treated mouse. So we look forward to the results of a randomized placebo control trial of vomorolone in Duchenne. So let's finish up now by talking about treatment. So first of all, when we treat osteoporosis in this setting, we have to take care of nutritional deficiencies. Remember that glucocorticoids increase catabolism of 25 vitamin D. So you really need to be watching 25 vitamin D levels and optimizing there. I don't usually use calcium supplementation because hypercalciuria can be a problem in this condition but certainly I do if the patient is truly calcium deficient, but otherwise we try to get calcium through the diet. We do recommend treating delayed puberty in an age and cognitive maturational appropriate fashion, and we discussed that in a recent review article with David Weber. Many of the boys are not quite ready to start testosterone, even though they're 13, 14, and so it's a conversation we have and we make them aware that this is a therapy that they can tap into. Fall prevention is critical, not just in the patient, but also in the caregivers, especially in Canada, we have lots of trips and falls on the ice. So I spend a lot of time talking about that. Now growth hormone is not routine in the management of Duchenne because there simply is insufficient data on the safety and efficacy of growth hormone in this setting. So I'd like to now, before I launch into the osteoporosis therapies, just say this is indeed an aggressive osteoporosis. So we have to meet that aggressive osteoporosis with an aggressive treatment. This is my list of agents that I, uh, or rather lists of qualities that I would like to see in an osteoporosis agent for Duchenne, my wish list. I would like an agent that activates bone turnover on trabecular surfaces. I'd like an agent that increases periosteal opposition of long bones and promotes vertebral body reshaping. I'd like an agent that doesn't lead to deterioration in bone after I stop. I'd like to prevent incident vertebral and non-vertebral fractures. I need an agent that's effective for pain relief due to vertebral fractures, an agent that has a reasonable cost, of course, acceptable side effects, convenient. And I'd really like an agent that is not only safe, but also beneficial to muscle. So these are the therapies that we can talk about. Now, I just wanna say that androgen therapy, I consider adjuvant. It may modulate BMD in Duchenne, but I do not consider this being potent enough to prevent fractures. So we're really talking about the big hitters here, bisphosphonates, rank ligand inhibition, parathyroid hormone, and anti-sclerostin antibody. We think of bone protection as being either anti-resorptive or anabolic. Bisphosphonates and rank ligand, of course, are anti-resorptive drugs. Parathyroid hormone is an anabolic drug. And anti-sclerostin antibody has dual action. So IV bisphosphonates are the most frequently used agents in pediatrics. They're long acting, which I think in the Duchenne setting where you have these persistence of risk factors, that's an advantage. They're uh, given every six months, for example, with zoledronic acid. They're highly effective for bone pain relief. And it's been shown in osteogenesis imperfecta that they are better than oral bisphosphonates for spine protection. And I think that's important when we think about the Duchenne space. Of course, it's an IV. 
IV uh, bisphosphonates exacerbate the low bone turnover that's pre-existing before starting, and there can be significant first infusion side effects, including the first infusion, nausea, vomiting, hypocalcemia, uh, muscle and bone pain, but also I've seen bisphosphonates IV precipitate adrenal insufficiency and rhabdomyolysis have been, has been described in the literature. So what happens when you give intravenous pimidronate or intravenous zoledronic acid to boys with steroid-treated Duchenne who have a high vertebral fracture burden at baseline? So this is 27 vertebral fracture events in seven boys treated for two years with IV bisphosphonates. This is at baseline where you can see that they have a high fracture burden, 77% have moderate and severe fractures, with a peak frequency of fractures in the mid thoracic region. And this is a very consistent observation across all steroid di diseases in, um, in children. So after two years of IV bisphosphonate therapy, this is what we see. The sagittal bar represents the change in the vertebral height ratio at the different levels on average. So you can see that in green, 52% of the fractures had at least partial reshaping. In blue, 40% of the fractures stabilized. Back pain improved in everyone and spine volumetric BMD went up in the majority. Now, there were two boys who had one vertebral body each that had a loss in vertebral height ratio that did not reach fracture grade over the two years, and we noticed that. And so that leads me to tell you about what I see as a representative example after long-term intravenous bisphosphonate therapy and steroid-treated Duchenne if it started early. So this boy, he's eight, he's on steroids, he has a grade one vertebral fracture. We start zoledronic acid every six months, he stays on his steroids. I titrate the dose to achieve a normal rate of bone and mineral accrual. And at 17, he has a normal BMD of the spine, he has no back pain, he's off to college, and he's doing Doing, uh, as well as expected in the steroid treated Duchenne sense. But look at his spine x-ray on the right. He has had some further loss in vertebral height ratios in the lumbar spine. And yet that's despite a normal BMD and nice densification of the end plates. It looks like he's got a little bit of spondylolisthesis emerging and I wonder whether the progression in vertebral fractures, particularly in the lumbar spine, which is where we often see it, is related actually to spine biomechanics given that hyperlordosis of Duchenne. So that was a typical representation. This is atypical. Most boys stay on, the, stay on their steroids. If they stop their steroids and they grow and you start bisphosphonates early enough so they have enough residual growth potential, then you will see vertebral body reshaping and nice thickening of the cortex. So those were observational studies. What about if you give zoledronic acid intravenously and compare that to an intravenous placebo. This is unpublished data, so I can only show you some highlights. This was 34 children with a variety of steroid-treated diseases, of whom 38% had steroid-treated Duchenne. And after one year of zoledronic acid versus IV placebo, the difference in the change in lumbar spine BMDZ score was 0.4, and that was significant. Two children on placebo had new low trauma VF and previously normal vertebral bodies and 83% of children had AEs on zoledronic acid versus 75% on placebo. So this manuscript is uh, getting ready for submission and I look forward to talking about that uh, again in the future. So here's our standard of care based on all the information that we have before us now. And I'd like to just say where we've come from. So in 2010, the CDC recommendations were to do a spine x-ray if there was back pain or kyphosis. And that was reasonable because at that time we didn't know vertebral fractures were so frequent and so often asymptomatic. And then the recommendation was to treat vertebral fractures with an IV bisphosphonate. In 2018, we revised these guidelines with all the information we have available to us now. And we recommend that you monitor the spine from the time of diagnosis or steroid initiation with periodic spine x-rays. You treat early signs of vertebral collapse with IV bisphosphonates and you treat the first long bone fractures without waiting for additional fractures. Now you may say, why not treat before there's first fractures? And I think that's absolutely where we're headed, but we're simply just not there yet in terms of evidence. <clears throat> 
So this is the same approach, just mapped out more graphically. We have the monitoring phase. We treat at early signs. We use IV bisphosphonates. We induce puberty uh, in an age and maturational appropriate stage fashion. And we continue bisphosphonates IV at least as long as the boys are on steroids, if not longer, if there's persistent bone issues. For me, the monitoring phase is a very important part of this algorithm. We recommend yearly bone densities. If a child is on steroids, we recommend spine x-rays every one to two years from the time of steroid initiation. If they're not on steroids, we recommend spine x-rays every two to three years from the time of diagnosis. And you do your spine x-rays more often if there's back pain or if the bone density declines by more than half a standard deviation over a 12 month period. And then you treat early and not late signs. So let's talk now about denosumab, rank ligand inhibition, which is also an anti-resorptive therapy. Denosumab is a fully human monoclonal antibody to rank ligand that prevents rank ligands binding to rank so that you disrupt the formation of osteoclast precursors. So the activity of denosumab is pre-bone, if you will. Denosumab has been approved in adults for postmenal osteoporosis, GOP, steroid induced osteoporosis, and male osteoporosis. It is not approved in children. So, DMAB is powerful. It's given every three to six months subcutaneously. It's well tolerated in adults, and it may have positive effects on muscle in Duchenne. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. The considerations are that we're just starting to get our feet wet with this agent. Some of the families with OI are reporting joint pains with the first couple of doses of denosumab. And then we also have this rebound phenomenon whereby even in between doses, not just when you stop, you can have a resurgence of bone turnover markers and a resurgence of resorption that causes hypercalcemia, drops in BMD, and in adults, vertebral fractures have been described. So this is a study by Jerome Frenette out of Laval University in Quebec City, and he shows that first of all, rank ligand and osteokine is expressed in dystrophic muscle. And so then he's thought, well, since rank and rank lighting and are part of the inflammatory pathway of Duchenne, then what if we shut down rank ligand using rank ligand antibody? And so he's done that in a eutrophin haploinsufficiency mouse and in the top montage, you can see that the specific force of the extensor digitorum longus was greater on high dose rankle antibody compared to no therapy. Uh, in blue, and that muscle damage was less on high dose rankle antibody compared to no therapy in this mirroring model of MDX, and CK activity was also less on high dose rank ligand antibody compared to the untreated MDX mouse. This is my experience with the rebound phenomenon. This is a boy with OI type 6 who was on denosumab every three months for this condition. I did a bone biopsy uh, during therapy and I saw these huge osteoclasts and I thought, well, I shouldn't be seeing osteoclasts. The osteoclast formation should be shut down. And then not long after, he came back with hypercalcemia and hypercalceria leading up to a dose uh, that was to take place two months later. So uh, clear evidence of the rebound here. So as we think about denosumab, I ask myself, first of all, do we need higher doses to benefit muscle than, do, than uh, what we use for osteoporosis? Jerome used uh, a higher dose than we would use typically in the clinical setting. So if we want to achieve muscle benefits, what dose do we need to use? And furthermore, is the rebound phenomenon in Duchenne even a consideration because OI is a high bone turnover state, Duchenne is a low bone turnover state, will the osteoclast suppressive effects of steroids keep that rebound in check? Or will the rebound be an issue for us with denosumab when the boys go through puberty or with steroid cessation? So we have a tiny pilot study going on right now of denosumab versus zoledronic acid given every six months in boys with steroid treated Duchenne. The study is finished and I'll be excited to tell you about that study uh, sometime in the next year. So I'd like to finish up now by talking about the anabolics and leaving you with some thoughts as we go forward. So remember that when you use anti-resorptive therapy, 
that you're targeting bone density and bone density is most modifiable at trabecular sites, at sites where you're, the bone is inherently porous, so there's room to modify the bone density. So as a result, antiresorptives are generally fairly um, helpful at the spine and less so at compact bone like long bones because the bone is already densely packed. Uh, but antiresorptives do not increase periosteal apposition and that's what we need in this setting. So let's start by talking about parathyroid hormone first. Lots of experience in adults used in low bone turnover states. There's an FDA black box warning against its use in children because of preclinical studies using very high doses that showed osteosarcoma in rats. So not recommended pre epiphyseal fusion. It's effective at the spine, but less so at the hip. There's rapid decline in BMD following discontinuation. It's only effective for about 18 to 24 months, not as effective following anti-resorptive therapy, and it's a daily subcutaneous injection. So this is a study that was just published by Nat Nezamyant, looking at the fate of 39 verbal fractures in six patients with Duchenne on teriparatide, mean age 17 years, youngest 13.9. Uh, and they looked at the fate of the vertebral morphology from baseline to one to two years after teriparatide. And you can see that most uh, that the verbal bodies improved in 31% of those fractures, stabilized in 29%, and deteriorate, deteriorated in 21%. Here's how teriparatide uh, holds up relative to denosumab and bisphosphonates. Does pretty well at the spine, not so well at the hip, which I think is an issue in Duchenne with this myopathy. And so finally, anti-sclerostin antibody. So remember, sclerostin inhibits bone formation and it revs up bone resorption. So the antibody releases the inhibition on bone formation and it suppresses bone resorption. So notionally, very nice in this setting. Anti-sclerostin antibody is a potent anabolic. It affects bone modeling and it acts on all four bone surfaces, trabecular, intracortical, periosteal, and endosteal. There's no published data in children, so I'm just speaking about it theoretically. There are safety concerns in adults, stroke and myocardial infarction relative to alendronate. There's lack of persistent benefit to bone formation after one year, even if remaining on drug. If stopped, BMD and bone turnover uh, returns to a baseline, and it is best if used before anti-resorptive therapy. So this is what anti-sclerostin antibody looks like in the rat. Look at the far right, the high dose treated rat compared to the untreated rat on the far left. And you can see right away that periosteal apposition and that those nice geometric changes. This is a study looking at what happens to BMD at the hip and the spine in adults with bromozozumab, which is an anti-sclerostin antibody. You get a nice boost. If you go on placebo uh, after a couple of years, the BMD declines again. And then if you reintroduce Romo, the BMD goes up again at both sites. To prevent that decline, if you bridge the two doses with denosumab, you maintain the gains that were realized with the first dose and you get an ongoing boost with the second dose, although not as much as you had with the first dose. So this is sequential therapy and the most potent combination for sequential therapy is romazozumab followed by denosumab. So these are my thoughts that I leave you with as we go forward. This is a theoretical trial of sequential therapy in Duchenne. I'd like to start with romazozumab uh, or antisclerostin antibody in the subclinical phase before there's any fractures to bring about those bone geometric changes that foster bone strength. And then I'd like to seal in the effect of the Roma with denosumab and also try to get some benefit to muscle. And then perhaps redo that with another boost to Rom with romazozumab in order to bring about those geometric changes and then seal the entire effect in with a long acting agent uh, towards the end of therapy. Maybe there's even a role during childhood for sequential saltatory therapy where you keep intermittently boosting the bone formation in order to bring about maximal bone geometric changes.
The other thought that I'll leave you with, and this is my last slide, except for my acknowledgements, is to say that there is intense effort to improve the myopathy. And so when there is a post-steroid era, and I do believe that we're headed in that direction, then we will need likely different guidelines for bone health monitoring and treatment in order to cater to that space where we hope that bone will be better as a result of the improvement in the myopathy. I'd like to thank my many, many uh, collaborators in the Duchenne uh, care and research space in the Ottawa-Montreal uh, corridor, including Frank Rauch, who's also actively working in the Duchenne field, and my Canadian colleagues and my international colleagues. And I'd like to say a special thanks to PPMD for bringing us all together a few years ago from which a number of fruitful collaborations have sprung. So thank you very much and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Leanne. That was just really a phenomenal talk. Um, and I think what I'll do is um, we have a lot of people sending questions through chat. If you could do that through the Q&A, that would be terrific. Um, and what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to just open with one very simplistic question, Leanne. I've asked you about the situations before and some patients I've had. But um, I find by the time you see even anterior wedging on x-ray, it's very, very difficult to reverse. Like you um, said, unless there's significant amount of growth, you really won't see a significant improvement in these children on so much prednisone. And in terms of what you see in VFA on DEXA, um, you know, you're able to see quite a bit. You showed a, a and I was wondering about the role of more frequent uh, VFA by DEXA, perhaps, because once the change, seen, the change is seen on x-ray, it's often difficult to reverse. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good point. And that's why I showed you that representative example, because when I look at the spine and I start a bisphosphonate in a boy with vertebral fractures who's staying on steroids, I do not promise vertebral body reshaping. I say to the family, now this is not likely to reshape because you're not growing well. And of course, we accept that as a side effect at the moment because that's what steroids do. They prevent growth. Uh, but what we're trying to do instead is just maintain the integrity of that vertebral body. But I think it speaks to your point uh, in the sense that once you already have some collapse, even a little bit, you've set off the vertebral ca fracture cascade. And obviously the later it goes before treatment, the harder it is to rein in. But even with early collapse, it's not perfectly reined in by IV bisphosphonate therapy. So that's why I think we need to start working on prevention of first fracture trials and why the uh, anti-sclerostin antibody therapies of, are of such interest to me, because if we can preserve the bone modeling process and the height of the vertebral bodies, then that's gonna ultimately preserve the integrity of the spine. Right. So you're thinking about things, I think, right in the right direction. So we have a lot of questions rolling in, and I apologize ahead of time if I get in first or last name. But the first uh, question is uh, from someone named Maury. What variables do you include in your Z-score BMD analyses? Well, thank you, Maury, for that question. So when I'm looking at BMD, first of all, I just want to make the point that I look at the trajectory. So I don't put a lot of emphasis on a single cross-sectional measurement. And then the factors that are relevant to the BMD Z-score, uh, first and foremost, is height and also pubertal stage or bone age. And so I think we need to take care of those variables when interpreting that test. Now that said, the trajectory is really what's going to speak volumes. If a BMD is going down over time, then that's a concern whether the child is growing well or not. So the next question is from Aditi Kokar. What, is your, what are your criteria for starting bisphosphonate therapy in a patient with low BMD with no history of fracture? And it's followed up by another question. And do we have to wait for the fracture to happen to start therapy? Yeah, I mean, that is the, that is the question of the hour, right? So um, 
we need to be working towards prevention of first fractures. I showed you the, the montage that provides the evidence for treating the earliest signs. I mean, recognize that in 2010, no one was monitoring for early signs of vertebral fractures. They were waiting till they presented to medical attention more advanced. Now we're saying treat at the earliest signs of vertebral fractures because that is the evidence that we feel we have to support that recommendation. Where are we headed? Prevention of first fractures. I don't feel that we're there yet in terms of choosing the optimal agent and having the justification to do that. And we don't have the trials to support that in terms of really understanding the benefits and the efficacy. So I do not start treatment on the basis of BMD, but I do look for the very earliest signs. And I look at the spine. I look at the spine very closely. And if there's an equivocal vertebral body, I err on the side of it being a fracture versus not a fracture because we know that vertebral fractures herald future problems. So another question um, from Shipra, uh, which bone density trend do you follow if the whole body hip and spine trends are going in different directions? Right, so I follow them all. I follow all sites, I even do PQCT. So I um, you know, have the attitude that osteoporosis works differently in different parts of the skeleton. And so to understand the boy, I need to understand what's going on at different sites. And remember, how do we use BMD? We use BMD to determine if we have to do spine x-rays more often or VFA more often. So we recommend spine x-rays every one to two years in a steroid treated boy. If the BMD, the absolute BMD, goes down by more than half a standard deviation at any skeletal site, then you would do the spine x-ray more often. So that is the way that BMD is used. It informs your frequency of spine x-rays or VFA by DEXA. Thank you. The next question is a general question from Tamar Baer. Are there screening guidelines for using DEXA? Yes, um, I mean, there's a, there's a few sources. So I would refer to the uh, ISCD recommendations that have been published for the use of DEXA in children. And there are some review articles just generally on steroid induced osteoporosis that provide recommendations as well. I would start with the ISCD criteria and go from there because they talk a lot about the technical aspects, including the impact of stature and the impact of pubertal development and just the importance of doing very highly precise measurements by a technologist who has experience doing BMD in children. Lots of bone density questions here today. Here's a uh, treatment question um, from Dr. Farasat. What are your recommendations or comments on combining growth hormone with glucocorticoids in Duchenne's? Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's Farasat Zaman from Stockholm. Sorry. Yes. Hi, Farasat. Yeah, thank you for that question. So uh, I'm glad you asked the question. Um, so first of all, we know that the growth failure of Duchenne appears to be in the vast majority of boys and organ failure. So there is chondrocyte apoptosis in the setting of glucocorticoids and growth hormone secretory status is usually not the main driver behind the growth failure. And so growth hormone in steroid treated diseases, recognizing that Duchenne is very high dose, is not sufficient to really hold back or deal with the growth issue. So that glucocorticoid effects on the end organ are so powerful that I am not optimistic that growth hormone can make a meaningful difference to growth in this setting. So I, uh, is not, it's not something I recommend. The evidence-based guidelines that we published with the CDC group and with David Weber also do not promote growth hormone as routine standard of care. Okay, well, they're really rolling in here. I can't keep up. Um, a question from Marja. This is, a, this is a question a lot of people seem to wonder. Do you measure markers of bone turnover and does that influence when you start anti-resorptives? Mm -hmm. I, I measure them. Um, however, they do not alter the treatment plan. So I still treat 
on the basis of early signs of vertebral fractures instead of late signs of vertebral fractures. And then I titrate dose once you've stabilized the osteoporosis on the basis of the bone mineral accrual rate and the child's fracture history and back pain. So my dosing is very much guided by the boy and how he's doing from a pain and fracture and bone mineral density trajectory perspective. Thank you. Another question from Shipra. What precautions do you take to avoid adrenal insufficiency and rhabdomyolysis with zolendronate mm -hmm. besides allowing them to take their routine steroid dosing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So for um, adrenal insufficiency, first of all, I make sure that the families are aware of the signs of adrenal insufficiency. So we provide the families with intramuscular hydrocortisone so they can take that home and give an emergency dose uh, if it's needed. We have um, an on-call service that is there to provide the families with support after that first dose. We have a very low threshold for starting supplemental hydrocortisone if they show signs of adrenal insufficiency. So let me just explain that. We know that nausea and vomiting is frequent after the first infusion of zoledronic acid. So I err on the side of caution in that setting. If there's a boy with significant nausea and vomiting, I will start adrenal insufficiency management at that point. So I think education, intramuscular hydrocortisone availability, an on-call service to provide support, and a low threshold for giving supplemental hydrocortisone is the key to adrenal insufficiency management. Now that said, it actually doesn't happen that often, but it's happened enough that I think it's important to, to communicate. Uh, and even, of course, one case of adrenal insufficiency is concerning because it can be so dramatic. Now, in terms of the rhabdomyolysis, I have not seen this, and I have given, uh, you know, thousands of uh, doses to boys with Duchenne. I would um, recommend, in general terms, to maintain hydration. And um, apart from that, I don't have any additional ideas, and I don't have experience with that myself. There may be other clinicians on this call that do that could chat with you. So another DEXA-related question. Um, do you use adjusted dexamine bone ages um, or height adjusted due to short stature? And this is from Rachel Bello. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for the question, Rachel. So there's a lot of questions, isn't there, here about bone density. Um, so I, I'm going to just simplify it for you here, just in the sense that um, the osteoporosis is so aggressive that when you see declines, even if they're being contributed to by short stature or contributed to by pubertal uh, delay, those declines are clinically significant because we know the natural history is on a trajectory towards fractures. So, you know, for that reason, I think that we can keep it fairly simplistic when we look at bone density trajectories in boys with Duchenne. And in the CDC 2018 guidelines, we did not recommend that you adjust for height or bone age if you have that half or standard deviation decline, because we know that you should be using your DEXA as an overall guide to prompt more frequent spine x-rays, which are the most important part of the monitoring process. Now, that said, when I uh, look at a BMD just in general terms and I'm reporting on that, I do adjust for height Z score. We use height adjusted BMD Z scores that were published by Zemel. And that has been our main mechanism for taking into account height adjustment. Um, in terms of the bone age, I'm looking for whether there's a departure of more than a year. And in the clinical setting, I do not add the bone age adjustment to the height Z score I'm not sure. Sorry? Oh, you're back. Sorry. You were frozen for a second. It could have been me. I apologize. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, what was, what was I saying there? So um, in the clinic, um, I use height Z score adjusted BMD Z scores. When I go to report in research studies, I also take pubertal stage into account. So I hope that answers your questions. What I'm hearing from this uh, cluster of questions is people have a lot of questions about bone density interpretation in this setting. I, I can appreciate that. Here's a side effect question. Have you had any experience with the risk for AFib with solidronic acid therapy in these boys with Duchenne? And this is from Angelina Bernier. Yeah, thanks Angelina for that question. That's a really good question. 
Um, I have not had any boys under, uh, undergo atrial fibrillation in the setting of zoledronic acid. I have had families and other physicians ask me the question. And in particular, I had a patient a couple of years ago who had um, some pre-existing heart issues that raised the question whether zoledronic acid would be safe. And I conferred with the cardiologist at the time and it was decided that it was safe to proceed and the boy has not had any problems. So this seems to be uh, an issue of, of the adult osteoporosis space uh, more so than the pediatric osteoporosis space. And to date, I haven't seen problems in Duchenne, but I agree with you that it's something that we need to keep in mind as we go forward. So Aviva Sofer has a question, a specific question on what you'd recommend for a 13-year-old prepubertal boy with obesity been on chronic steroids, now intermittent steroids, who has no fractures on x-ray and normal bone density and no history of fractures. Mm -hmm. So again, in keeping with those CDC guidelines, in a 13-year-old boy who does not have any evidence of vertebral fractures but is on steroids, we would recommend frequent spine x-rays because we do anticipate that he's likely to develop fractures over time. Jared Wong's work really speaks to that probability of fractures, right? So that we would expect a clinical fracture um, after two years with a probability of about 10% and then after eight years, more like 50%. So you want to keep imaging the spine and start therapy at the earliest sign of a vertebral fracture. Great. And it looks like Jared is the next question. Um, is there a case of escalating therapy or increasing frequency, especially if on the maintenance 12 monthly bisphosphonate period? Mm -hmm. So I thank you, Jared, for that question. I never exceed the zoledronic acid 0 0.1 milligram per kilo per year or the pimidronate 9 milligram per kilo per year. That said, we really typically use zoledronic acid. Um, and so the way that I dose in my clinic is the first dose is 0 0.0125 milligram per kilogram and subsequent doses are 0 0.025 milligram per kilogram zoledronic acid every six months. And the reason that I go with that dose is because the boys are on steroids for so very long. And then if on the 0 0.025 milligram per kilogram every six months, there is worsening of back pain or incident fractures uh, or unexpected declines in BMD beyond what I would expect, then I increase the dose to 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram every six months. So that has been my practice in the clinic to date with long-term bisphosphonate prescription and escalation. Great. Angelina Bernier has a question. What approach are you taking to attenuate risk for atypical fracture after a prolonged duration of therapy, meaning over five years? And also, are there any further practical tips to attenuate acute phase reaction in these boys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for the um, atypical femur fractures, that actually nicely links to the comment that I just made to Jared. So I do not use the 0 0.05 milligram per kilogram every six months over the very long term. I use the half dose protocol. So 0 0.025 mg per kg every six months because the bisphosphonates are prescribed with such a long term vision. And with that, I have not seen atypical femur fractures in my clinic. I think the most important determinant of femur fractures is periosteal apposition and its lack in Duchenne. And that's why I spent time talking to you, to, to you about this theoretical anabolic therapy. Now, in terms of the acute phase response, I mean, this is a, this is a real problem, isn't it? Um, it can be quite dramatic in some patients. They can come off their feet for a few days with bone and muscle pain, which is very distressing to families because of the underlying condition. I have only ever seen the acute phase in this setting be transient, so that's the good news. And so what we do to ameliorate the acute phase reaction is we first of all make sure they're optimal for calcium and vitamin D. We don't give the first dose until we're happy in that respect. And we use Advil in order to cover off the acute phase symptoms and a low threshold for um, addressing adrenal insufficiency, which I think contributes to some of the side effects with that first dose. Great. 
So that's a great question. And, you know, that's why I took time today to talk about denosumab, which uh, is well tolerated with the first dose in adults. And our preliminary data from our pilot study is looking very good from a first dose exposure point of view. Obviously, though, we have other considerations there, but I do think we need to be thinking about other options that won't be quite as challenging for families with that first dose. Great. I should mention, Leanne, you're getting tons of comments about your excellent presentation. Um, <laughs> but one um, basic question that is actually difficult to answer is when do you stop bisphosphonates? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, there have been no long term studies in Duchenne muscular dystrophy starting in childhood and stopping in adulthood that look at outcomes subsequently. So our recommendations take their cue in part from logic and in part from the adult steroid induced osteoporosis literature. Steroids are so aggressive and the underlying myopathy so persistent, in fact, relentless, that we have recommended that we provide bone protection from the time of early signs right through until the end of glucocorticoid therapy. At the end of glucocorticoid therapy, if you have a boy who has a spine that is fairly intact and bone density Z scores that are reasonable for age and gender and height and pubertal stage, and he's not having active fractures, then I think that would be a point at which you could say, let's take a break and see how things go. Recognizing that we don't have post discontinuation data. Uh, but if that boy has residual active osteoporosis issues, then I would recommend continuing even longer term. And because of this very long term nature, that is part of the reason why I go with lower doses in my clinic uh, from the get go. And I should have acknowledged that was from Noena Abid. Thank you, Noena. Um, Anna asked a question that, um, well, the first part of her, her question you asked, the second part is interesting. What are your thoughts of oral bisphosphonates and early osteoporosis before significant fractures? So mm -hmm. that was already encompassed in a prior question. But do we see similar results with pomidronate versus zolendronate? Zoledronic acid. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, thank you, Anna, for that question. So oral bisphosphonates given in the asymptomatic phase, if I've um, read your question right. So oral bisphosphonates, I didn't talk about them a lot today because I had a lot to get through, um, but they have been studied in very nice randomized trials of osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a condition that is exquisitely sensitive to anti-resorptive therapy at the spine when given IV. In these oral trials of bisphosphonates in osteogenesis imperfecta, they did not perform well as well as IV for spine protection. The studies didn't go head to head, but looking at the study separately, it's clear that IV bisphosphonates protect the spine in terms of vertebral body reshaping and OI better than oral bisphosphonates. The other thing that in some of the oral bisphosphonate randomized trials, and I encourage you to, to look at these uh, carefully, including a large study out of the UK by Rooney et al. looking at resedronate versus placebo in steroid treated children, the bone turnover markers did not decline on resedronate. And yet declining bone turnovers is the biological signature of an anti-resorptive agent. So for those reasons, we do not recommend oral bisphosphonate therapy for the treatment of osteoporosis in this setting. Now, using them in the asymptomatic phase. I mean, nobody has really looked at that in a meaningful way in Duchenne with comparison to no treatment or placebo. But I would be concerned in doing that, that you would perhaps be making families hopeful that the oral bisphosphonate may be having some clinically meaningful effect on the spine when in fact it is not. So that is not a practice that I have adopted. Uh, nor is it one that we've recommended, but I think it would be a very interesting one to look at in clinical trials. Uh, in terms of pimidronate versus zoledronic acid, the two have not gone head to head in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, pimidronate is given over four hours and um, it seems to be a little bit gentler in terms of those first infusion side effects. Zoledronic acid is given over one hour. 
Uh, and you know, they're both powerful bisphosphonate. So I tell people that if you're using pimidronate, I don't think you're compromising um, the osteoporosis management. Zoledronic acid is um, largely just more convenient and uh, it does have a little bit more in the way of first infusion side effects, which you need to take into account. Thank you, Leanne. Um, here's a question that you can incorporate a lot of what you've talked about, given a specific case. Rachel Bellow asks, um, there's a 10-year-old boy with Duchenne's on prednisone for seven years. T8, symptomatic fracture, started pimidronate, and a year after x-ray shows T5 through 9 fractures, much of like what you showed within your lecture. However, he's asymptomatic. Would you call it already a treatment failure? And would you move on to zoledronic gas? Mm -hmm. You know, great question. Um, I, we don't know the answer to that. I certainly would not be opposed to starting zoledronic acid. It, uh, you know, is, is a potent agent. Um, but what you have just described is quite typical. And what's interesting to me is that when these incident fractures develop, they are invariably asymptomatic. So where the boy is concerned, he's doing well because lack of back pain is one of our critical endpoints. And so it really is very interesting when you see these changes in morphology, to what extent are they truly fractures versus deformity that comes about for other reasons like the spine biomechanical issues that I described earlier. So I think you've mapped out a very important issue and that's why I took the time to talk about it in the talk as well. And I'd be interested to know what happens when you switch, if you switch to zoledronic acid. I don't think switching is a big deal, so it could be tried, but the truth is we simply don't know the answer to your question. So I think we will, um do one more question. Um, there, there are quite a few, but in um, looking over all of them, I'm going to pick one that's um, very general. Um, just in terms of DEXA scans, uh, is there a DEXA reference for children at different ages? I thought this would be a good one for anyone who doesn't focus on bone disease. Mm -hmm. So you're asking, uh, thank you for that question, whether there are reference data for BMD in children. In fact, there are, there's um, fairly good reference data. Now, uh, your machine may produce uh, child reference data. And if not, you can ask your manufacturer if they have reference data that will come then populated uh, via the machine. And uh, there are also references in the literature. And again, if you go to the ISCD, um, position statements on the use of DEXA in children, you can find various pediatric reference data. Now, there's a few things to just know about pediatric uh, reference data. First of all, the very best reference data is reference data that's come from your own locale. Most of us, though, don't have reference data from our own locale with our own population of children in the healthy setting. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind, and I published a paper on this uh, a few years ago with Jin Wee Ma and JCNM, and you can have a look at that. But different reference data give different Z scores. So if you take a child from my, my setting in Ottawa and you put that child on different reference databases, you will get different Z scores that vary by as much as two standard deviations. And why is that? Simply because the reference data have been developed on different children around the world. That said, the relationship between BMD and fractures is quite linear. So the lower the BMD, the higher the fracture rate, regardless of the database that you used. And again, we published on that. So the absolute use of Z scores to define osteoporosis, like if you're minus two or worse, you have osteoporosis combined with a fracture, to me is a little bit challenging because these different reference data databases all give different Z scores. So I, I hope that's helpful to you. I, I'd be happy to chat with you. My email was on that acknowledgement slide. If I can assist you as you go forward doing DEXA in your locale with children, I'd be happy to do that. 